This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silenced them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 116, Itaberly Lozano. On January 7, 2017, police in Crevinos, Brazil, discovered a charred body in a sugarcane field and soon identified the remains as belonging to 17-year-old Itaberly Lozano, whose grandmother reported him missing days earlier. Before long, the investigation uncovered a diabolical murder plot orchestrated by Itaberly's own mother, Tatiana Ferreira Lozano Pereira, who hired two young hitmen to kill her son. When her hired thugs refused to end Itaberly's life, Tatiana herself stabbed her own child to death. This is the story of a vivacious, outgoing teenager whose relationship with his mother crumbled when he told her he was gay. It's also the story of a mother who so much preferred a dead son to a homosexual one that she twice solicited others to attack him before she herself ended his promising young life. This is the horrific story of Itaberly Lozano. Before I get started, I'd like to thank my newest patrons, Max N. from Coolville, Ohio, Bree M. from The Upside Down, and special thank you to Alyssa P. from Salt Lake City. Thank you to all my patrons for your support, which is a huge, huge help to me as I try to devote myself to the podcast full-time. Researching this case has been a real shock to my system. I cannot imagine any circumstances in which a parent would rather their child be dead than gay because I have a 17-year-old of my own who's part of the LGBTQ plus community, Itaberly's story hit particularly close to home, at least emotionally. Geographically was another story. This case took place in Brazil, so the vast majority of my sources were originally in Portuguese. I had to rely heavily on Google Translate for my research. Any quotes in this episode were also originally in Portuguese, so if they came out of the translator sounding awkward... I reworded them slightly to make sense of them without changing their meaning. As I've said in past episodes involving other languages, I apologize if I mangle any pronunciations, but I promise I did my best. Finally, thank you so much to everyone who showed me support after I spewed my feelings all over Facebook last week. I've been experiencing signs of burnout for a while now, but I keep pushing through because I can't stop telling these kids' stories. I'm going to try to focus on self-care in the meantime and set a more healthy schedule for myself if that's possible. I appreciate all of you more than I can ever express, and I love you all. With that, let's get into today's story. Cravinos is a town of just under 36,000 people, located in the metropolitan region of Ribeiro Preto in southern Brazil in the state of Sao Paulo. In 2016, in a small house in Cravinos, lived a family of four, consisting of 32-year-old Tatiana Ferreira Lozano Pereira, a manager at a local supermarket, her husband, 30-year-old tractor driver Alex Cantelli Pereira, the couple's four-year-old son, who I'll call M, and Tatiana's 17-year-old son, Itaberly Lozano, who was born from a previous relationship. Itaberly, who attended Professor Fernando de Campos Rosas, a state school located in Cravinos, was a vivacious, outgoing 17-year-old with an optimistic outlook on life. He was a stunning young man with a slender frame, wavy dark hair, a cleft chin, a nose piercing, and brown eyes rimmed with long, dark lashes, as well as a bright, beautiful smile thanks to the braces he wore for some time. Itaberly has been described as a cheerful, intelligent, polite young man who worked hard and wanted to make something of himself. While he attended school, Itaberly also maintained a job as a clerk at the same supermarket where his mother worked. 
In his spare time, he loved spending time with his friends and listening to music. He was also a budding photographer, posting the photos he took of various models to his Facebook page. Like most kids his age, he also posted dozens of selfies, many of which included one or more of his many friends, or his baby brother, who had Taberly adored. By the end of 2016, from the outside, Tatiana, Alex, Itaberly, and little M appeared to make up the perfect family, but as is often the case, things beneath the surface weren't exactly as they seemed. About three years before, Itaberly came out as gay, and since that revelation, tension began to grow between the teenager and his mother, who evidently could not accept her son's sexual orientation. Their arguments escalated, becoming louder and more vehement over time. Still, Itaberly clung fiercely to the love he carried for his mother. No matter how bitterly they argued over his sexuality, he never stopped loving his mom. On a photo Tatiana posted on Facebook in June of 2016 of Itaberly and his younger brother, Itaberly commented, You are the perfect mother. I love you so much, my love, my most beautiful queen in the world. Along with a photo Itaberly posted on Facebook of himself and his smiling mother, Tatiana, he wrote, I always want to see this happiness on your face, your bright smile that makes me feel so good. Your upbeat mood is already a trademark. Your way of not holding grudges against anyone. Your will to succeed in life. I'm with God and I know God is with you. Your heart can't fit inside your chest. You're always full to overflowing with friends. You always have a word of comfort. You always have a word of consolation. You're always together and mixed with your people. In the rush, you always find time to demonstrate what it is to be real people, always seeking the good of humanity. Itaberly's unflagging love for his mother makes what happened next even more heartbreaking. On December 26, 2016, the day after Christmas, Itaberly made a shocking Facebook post that included not only a photo of his smiling family in festive Santa jackets and matching hats, but also several photos of various injuries all over his body, including scrapes, lacerations, and bruises. The Facebook post read, Itaberly Lozano added nine new photos, feeling strongly blessed. Remembering that this woman I called mother beat me and put a bunch of kids behind me to beat me, took me out of the house and kicked me. You know why? Because I'm gay. Talking is one thing, beating is another. Her name is Tatiana Pereira Lozano, better known as Tati Alex. At the moment, I'm in France, where I will stay because she ordered all the boys that when they see me, to hit me. Be careful, Brazil, with who you call your mother. Obs in the photo, it looks like we were happy, but that's it. Nobody knows what's going on behind a photo, and yet I still love it. After being savagely beaten by an unknown number of neighborhood boys put up to the attack by his own mother, Itaberly fled to the home of his paternal grandmother, Julia Gabriel Rosa, and Uncle Dario Gabriel Rosa where he planned to stay, at least for a while. Late on the evening of Thursday, December 29, 2016, Julia and Dario were almost asleep when Dario's phone rang past 11 p.m. The caller was Tatiana, who asked to speak with Itaberly. After Dario handed over the phone, Itaberly spoke with his mother for a few minutes. When they hung up, Itaberly got dressed, telling his grandmother and uncle that his mom wanted to talk to him and try to make peace, so she was sending someone to pick him up. Dario and Julia were skeptical, but they hoped Tatiana would actually change her attitude toward Itaberly because he loved his family so much, especially his little brother. A car pulled up with two people inside who appeared to be a man and a woman. It was unclear if Itaberly knew them, but he greeted them and got into the car, which immediately drove away. It was the last time Itaberly's grandmother and uncle saw him alive. Stress is the most common cause of tooth grinding and day clenching. Some of the stories I tell on this podcast are incredibly stressful, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to hear that after listening, some of you find yourself clenching your jaw or grinding your teeth in your sleep. Clenching and grinding leads to erosion of the tooth enamel, can cause cracked or chipped teeth, makes you susceptible to heightened tooth sensitivity, and may even result in infection. Once you lose that enamel, it doesn't grow back. It's gone forever. Fixing these dental problems can be super expensive. Crowns can cost anywhere from $800 to $3,000 per tooth. Veneers can run $400 to $2,500 for each tooth, and replacing your whole mouth full of teeth with implants can set you back anywhere from seven dollars to $90,000. The better option is prevention, right? 
Dentists offer night guards to protect your teeth, but they can cost anywhere between $225 and $600, not even counting the dental visit. Smile Brilliant, on the other hand, creates custom night guards for as low as $45 per guard. Depending on the package you purchase, reorders can be as low as $25 per guard. Smile Brilliant keeps a digital file of your dental impressions, making reorders at SmileBrilliant.com absolutely hassle-free. You can visit SmileBrilliant.com and use my promo code CHILDREN for 20% off your custom night guard. That's SmileBrilliant.com, promo code CHILDREN. While you're there, you can also shop for custom-fitted teeth whitening trays, whitening gel, electric toothbrushes, water flossers, and much more. By supporting Smile Brilliant, you're also supporting the show. That's SmileBrilliant.com, promo code CHILDREN. A couple days later, after not hearing back from Etaberly, Julia and Dario paid a visit to his mother to ask about him. Tatiana said that after they talked on the night of December 29th, Etaberly left the house, and she assumed he was staying with a friend. Uneasy, his grandmother and uncle left. After a couple more days without word from Etaberly, Julia and Dario were deeply worried. Disappearing was not Etaberly's style. He was a very responsible boy who was close with his family and friends, and there was no way he would just fall off the radar like this. Convinced something terrible had happened to her grandson, Julia went to the Curvinos civil police and reported Etaberly missing. She made a point to inform them about her grandson's rocky relationship with his mother, which immediately caught their attention. On Saturday, January 7th, in a desolate area of Cravinos, in a sugar cane field along the highway Jose Friganese, police discovered a completely charred and completely unrecognizable human body. They couldn't identify the victim's age or sex, but they could tell the body belonged to someone thin. With the charred body, they found a bracelet that had also been partially burned, which police took as evidence. The body was sent to be examined at the Institute of Forensic Medicine in Sao Paulo. The investigation into the murder was led by Helton Tosti Renz, the commissioner of the Cravino Civil Police Force. While police processed the scene at the cane field, residents of Cravinos, many of whom were already aware of the missing teenager, took to a community Facebook page where a page administrator posted a photo of a police car at the crime scene along with the caption, Burnt body is found in cane field in Cravinos. So far we don't know anything, but we are very curious. May God comfort the family. If you know any news, tell us. Amidst the dozens of comments below the photo, there were several remarks along the lines of, You already know who it is. A few commenters referenced the missing teenager, and some even left comments expressing the opinion that he was killed by his mother. Police, too, strongly suspected the body was Etaberly's. They took the partially burned bracelet to his grandmother, Julia, who confirmed the bracelet did indeed belong to her grandson. Although DNA testing would need to be conducted to positively identify the body, police were left with little doubt. Armed with the bracelet found with the body, police paid a visit to the Cantelli Lozano house to question his mother, Tatiana, and stepfather, Alex. It didn't take long before Tatiana confessed to what turned out to be the first version of her story of the events of December 29th. She said Etaberly was an out-of-control, aggressive, rebellious teenager who had been using drugs and bringing men home, and his behavior had led to arguments in the days leading up to his death. On that day, she claimed, Etaberly had attacked her, her husband, and their four-year-old son, saying he was going to kill them, so she acted in self-defense, accidentally stabbing her 17-year-old in the neck and killing him. Keep in mind, no one who knew Etaberly had ever reported seeing him act aggressively or violently toward anyone. There were inconsistencies between the stories Tatiana and Alex told police, so the investigation continued. Etaberly's paternal family flatly denied Tatiana's claims, saying Etaberly was a good, well-educated, hard-working boy who never used drugs. They pointed out that Tatiana never accepted her son's homosexuality and that her attitude toward her son's sexual orientation was the reason for the increased tension and frequent arguments in the home. Police searched the family home and their car, a red three-door Volkswagen Pointer, which was a car produced in the mid-90s in Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. From the home, they seized two knives that could have been used in the murder. Both the house and the car were tested with luminol, a chemical that detects the presence of blood even if attempts have been made to clean it up and it isn't visible to the naked eye. 
but it would take several months for the results of DNA testing on any blood found to be returned. Meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, Itaberly had made a damning Facebook post on December 26th about the attack he said was orchestrated by his mother. After murdering her son, Tatiana had used Itaberly's phone to delete the post from his profile. However, some of his friends had already captured screenshots, which they handed over to authorities. You can see a screenshot of the post in the Facebook album for this episode. On Wednesday, January 11, 2017, 32-year-old Tatiana Ferrero Lozano Pereira and 30-year-old Alex Cantelli Pereira were arrested. Tatiana was placed temporarily in a women's jail in Kajuru, while Alex was jailed in Santa Rosa Viterbo, both of which are cities within an hour's drive of Curvinos. The couple's shared lawyer, Fabiano Ravignani Jr., asked for the couple's provisional release from jail, claiming that Tatiana had acted in a state of emotion and self-defense, and maintaining that Itaberly was an aggressive drug user who had previously assaulted his mother, and adding that the teenager tried to kill his brother a year earlier. The lawyer said, She defended herself against her son and ended up committing this murder. The stepfather was sleeping, and when he woke up, she said, I just did something stupid. She confessed, said that she defended herself against her son, who had several previous incidents, including an attempt to suffocate his little brother three years old. They said that, in desperation, they took the body because they didn't want to keep it inside the house. Later, when it was discovered that it was her son, she confessed. Her emotion to this day, she's very upset. When interrogated for a second time, however, Tatiana gave police a wildly different version of the events of December 29th, telling police she had hired two boys to attack Itaberly to teach him a lesson, and they were the ones who really killed him. After he was dead, she woke her husband, Alex, who helped her dispose of the body in the cane field. The following day, she said, they returned to set Itaberly's body on fire. Itaberly's uncle, Dario Gabriel Rosa, took to the media on January 12th, denouncing Tatiana's claims of his nephew's drug use and mourning at Taberly, who he told EPTV was a well-behaved boy and a hard worker. He had a job, he was very polite, he never quarreled with anyone. He only had problems with his mother, who did not accept that he was a homosexual. His mother didn't accept it, and we were already suspicious because she didn't want to press charges. I think the mother has to take care of the child and not do what she did. He was a boy who worked, he was polite, he was a boy, but he was in the working stage. The crime was premeditated because his mother was very calm, and as soon as we made the complaint, she started to behave differently. We want justice to be done. If it was really her, she will have to pay, and the others who were involved too. A mother has to love her son, not kill. The family is torn. It will be difficult to recover. On the evening of Friday, January 13, 2017, two additional people were arrested for the murder of Itaberly Lozano. 19-year-old Victor Roberto da Silva and 18-year-old Miller da Silva Barisa were taken into custody, accused of being the young men Tatiana hired to attack her son. The confessions given to police by the two would-be assassins were fairly consistent. They said Tatiana had put them up to attacking Itaberly, which they were glad to do without being paid because they didn't like the teenager. According to both Victor and Miller, they hid in the house, waiting for Itaberly to return home on the night of December 29th, and ambushed him when he entered. One of the boys confessed to beating Itaberly with the intent to scare him, while the other claimed they just talked to him. After Itaberly was unconscious, Tatiana asked them to kill him, saying she could no longer bear to live with her son, but she couldn't take care of the problem alone. When they refused to end his life, both said, Tatiana herself stabbed her son in the neck, killing him. Another individual involved in the attack, a 16-year-old girl who has not been named, confirmed to police that both Victor and Miller attacked and beat Itaberly before his mother retrieved a knife and stabbed him. At that point, the girl said, the boys fled the house. Police Commissioner Helton Toasty Renz said, From what we've now found out, this crime was, in fact, premeditated. This changes the initial circumstance, which she said that during the fight, she ended up losing control and stabbed her son. Now she can be charged for her criminal association. Based on the evidence collected and the statements of the five accused, the following is what police believed happened that night. When Itaberly arrived and entered the home he shared with his mother, stepfather, and brother, Victor and Miller were waiting to ambush him. They began a savage attack on Itaberly, consisting of relentless shoves, punches, and kicks. 
During the attack, Ataberly was screaming for his mother to save him, pleading, Mom, I'm going to die. Once Ataberly was unconscious, Tatiana asked the young men to teach him a lesson by killing him. Miller and Victor looked at each other and thought about it for a moment, but neither was willing to go that far. Tatiana was determined to end her gay son's life. She went to the kitchen, grabbed a knife, turned Ataberly's head, and stabbed him in the neck in front of the two young men, who were shocked and fled the house. After Ataberly was dead, Tatiana woke Alex. The two of them wrapped Ataberly in a sheet and stuffed his body into the hatchback of their vehicle. They drove him to a desolate area of Cravinos full of sugarcane fields, where on the banks of the highway Jose Freganese, they stopped and unloaded his body. Tatiana dragged him a few meters into the canes and left him there. From there, Tatiana and Alex went home and cleaned up the murder scene, and Tatiana used Ataberly's phone to delete the post he made days earlier incriminating her in the first attack. The next day, they returned to the cane field, poured gas on Ataberly's body, and set it on fire so no one would recognize him. Commissioner Renz told the media that once DNA testing was done and the autopsy report completed, the investigation could be concluded. Putting together the reports, we will conclude the investigation, which will require the preventive detention of the four involved. The mother and stepfather may be charged with qualified homicide, concealment of a corpse, and criminal association. Although the couple's attorney had claimed a Taberly had a criminal record and a history with drugs, Commissioner Renz said, We have no formal record of aggression or fighting, whether with family or anyone else. As it turned out, on January 13th, Mr. Ravignani withdrew as the couple's lawyer. When the other two young men were interrogated, the commissioner said, they told police, She said that he was very withdrawn, that he caused a lot of trouble at home, which she had told us before. So she wanted to kill him, but alone she would not be able to handle it. They said to defend themselves that they did not accept the mother's proposal to end the victim's life, but they were fine with giving him a beating to teach him a lesson and scare him. Commissioner Renz also said he had ruled out the possibility of a crime of homophobia. I rule out anything about his sexual orientation. We know that he didn't have a good relationship with his mother, and that ended up culminating in the crime, but this disagreement between them was not due to homophobia. To me, it seems super early for him to make that determination within two days of the parents' arrests, especially in light of the paternal family's accusations and the deleted Facebook post by Ataberly himself. After the results of the luminol test's return, Commissioner Renz said, Tatiana and Alex should both be indicted for doubly qualified murder and concealment of a corpse. Then the case will be taken to court, and, if convicted, the stepfather and mother could face up to 33 years in prison. For the time being, all four defendants were being held in temporary detention, which could only last 30 days, which was why police were intent on closing the investigation as quickly as possible to avoid any of the individuals involved being released. On January 13th, Tatiana was transferred from the women's jail in Kajuru to the women's penitentiary in Tremembi, and Alex, Victor, and Miller were held in jail in Santa Rosa de Viterbo. A few days later, on January 16th, the public learned about Ataberly's deleted Facebook post blaming his mother for the homophobic attack on December 26th. Residents of Cravinos almost immediately began demonstrating, marching in the streets, and demanding justice for what they deemed a crime of homophobia. On January 17th, a lawyer from the Commission on Sexual Diversity of the Brazilian Bar Association, or OAB, told EPTV that she had evidence that Ataberly was murdered for being gay. Carolina Aram said neighbors and friends reported he had been villainized for years by his mother because of his sexual orientation. Ms. Aram learned of the case after receiving several complaints by phone, email, and internet, sent by various people within days of the discovery of Ataberly's body in the cane field. She said, We went straight to Curvinos, and the commissioner received us and informed us about everything that was happening in the police investigation. Soon after, we went to the courthouse and talked to the prosecutor, who also showed us the evidence. Prosecutor Wanderlei Trindagi asked Ms. Aram, she said, to gather as much evidence as she could of Tatiana's homophobia and present the material to the judge. She explained that she received audio and photos from people close to Ataberly but of course she would not reveal their identities for security reasons. The content of the audio shows that Ataberly suffered homophobic aggression for some years since he came out publicly as gay.
Meanwhile, in a post on Facebook, the 16-year-old girl involved in Itaberli's attack, who was Victor Huberto da Silva's girlfriend, wrote, You know, I wasn't even going to post anything about it, but people have judged me so much without even knowing about my life. I didn't kill anyone, much less saw them killing. I just saw the boys beat him up. Now that bitch who set all this up accuses us, and the boys won't go to prison. They're just jailed on a temporary basis until the tests on the knife prove that it wasn't them who killed him. She called them there, yes, to teach him a lesson. The boys went without earning anything, went to beat him up because they didn't like him anymore because he threatened the girls. Now they call me a murderer. I'm not a murderer. You know who the murderers are? All of you who are threatening me, saying you're going to cut me, kill me, and so on. You really are murderers saying that. Only God knows what I did. Only he can judge me. You stand there and threaten me with everything. I'm not afraid of anything in this life. I've been through everything. I'll go out on the street like normal. I'll go anywhere I want. I'm not staying at home. I know what I did, and I know what I didn't do. You really judge me. In a statement to the civil police, the girl said Tatiana contacted her on December 28th, asking her to recruit her boyfriend Victor and their friend Miller to kill her son in an ambush after she called him back home to tell him she wanted to make amends. The girl's statement read, As soon as Taberly entered the house, Tatiana went outside and told them, He's inside. Go there. When Victor and Miller entered and began to attack Etaberly, they beat him a lot, but even so, Etaberly managed to run to another room, and the attackers followed. According to the girl's statement, Victor and Miller then beat Etaberly until he was unconscious before leaving the room. Then, she heard Tatiana searching for something in a cutlery drawer in the kitchen. Her statement continued, Tatiana entered the room with the knife. The girl went to the bedroom door, and when she saw Tatiana turn Etaberly's head to the side to plunge the knife into his neck, she did not want to see a mother killing her own son, so she turned her face away so she wouldn't see it. The girl was released by police after giving her statement. On January 19, 2017, the teenage girl testified for two hours at the Crivinos Forum, or courthouse. She arrived at the courthouse with her mother, but during her testimony, she was accompanied by Prosecutor Wanderlei Trindadje and Raquel Ali Stein Mateus, Prosecutor for Child and Youth Court. Prosecutor Trindadje told the media the girl would also face charges of qualified homicide, saying, The teenager clarified the entire crime, the entire course, from the contact that Tatiana made with her to hiring Victor and Miller. They went to the place, talked with Tatiana, and with her cohabitant, Alex, and there they architected the entire crime of homicide. The crime is already completely unraveled. Only a few details are missing. Participation is well defined. Everyone will answer for the crime committed. Who struck the blow, who didn't, that's irrelevant. In Brazil, qualified murder is similar to aggravated murder in the U.S. in that their crime of homicide can be further qualified by what we would call aggravating factors, which include a base motive, such as killing for money or pleasure, a futile or insignificant motive, the use of insidious or cruel means, or the use of actions such as an ambush that prevent the victim from defending themselves. The prosecutor said that he expected Alex and Tatiana to be indicted for doubly qualified murder and concealment of a corpse. Victor and Miller, he said, would likely be indicted for qualified homicide and criminal association. Just over a week after giving her testimony at the forum, on January 27, the unnamed teenage girl was arrested and put into a hospital unit at the Casa Foundation in Ribeiro Preto. Child and Youth Court Prosecutor Raquel Elise Stein Mateus recorded the girl's testimony for two hours and later said, She described to me the way in which a taberly asked not to die in a very cold way. I believe she participated by attacking the victim, too. She said the girl had a history of aggressive behavior and was also suspected of assaulting a schoolmate in 2015. A police report was not taken at the time. Regarding the girl's current situation, Ms. Mateus said, She was hospitalized due to the seriousness of the crime, the history of aggression, for not showing regret, not showing a sense of responsibility, and for thinking that she will exempt herself from punishment for being a minor. If the girl's active participation in the murder was proven, she could remain in the hospital until she turned 21. On January 31, 2017, luminol testing finally proved the presence of human blood inside the home and the car. Civil Police Commissioner Renz said, We did find blood marks on the house, on the car, and we intend to close the investigation by Friday. 
We will definitely finish this week, because the temporary arrests expire on February 10th, so we have to conclude to give time to ask for preventive arrests. The DNA report has yet to arrive, to compare the sample provided by the mother with the body to prove that it was the victim, although this is already obvious. We are also waiting for test results for two knives that we seized at the house. One of them, according to the mother, was used in the crime. Then she changed her story. But because she mentioned the knife in her first version, we seized them, sent them for testing, and await the results. Two days later, on February 2nd, Tatiana was escorted by police to the family's house to participate in a reconstruction of the crime, during which she would lead police through a reenactment of the events that took place the night of December 29th, 2016 or at least her current version of them. Outraged community members swarmed over the area near the home, yelling at Tatiana and calling her a murderer. One person, however, directed her fury in the opposite direction. Tatiana's mother, Ana Maria Ferrero Lozano, screamed at authorities that her daughter was not homophobic. She took her son to the hairdresser, went on walks with him and his gay friends, and had a seamstress make the clothes he wanted. Of course, the comments made by Etaberly's paternal family members, not to mention Etaberly's own deleted Facebook post, strongly opposed Anna's statements. After the reenactment, which continued from the house to the sugarcane field where Etaberly's body was found, Commissioner Renz told the media, She limits herself to saying that she participated in the act of ambush until the moment the boy was taken into the house. The final blow, the stabbing, she attributes to the other two suspects who were in jail. According to the mother's version, she brought the body to the cane field right after the murder and returned the next day to set it on fire. The stepfather gives a different version in this regard. He said they set the body on fire the same day it was brought here. There was no significant change. Basically, they kept the versions presented in the investigation. There was no change from the interrogations previously carried out. The following week, a judge ordered the preventive detention of all four adult defendants. Tatiana would remain in the women's penitentiary in Tremembi to await trial, while Alex, Victor, and Miller would be transferred to the Provisional Detention Center, or CDP, in Sara Azul. On March 2, 2017, all of the suspects in Etaberly's murder were indicted. Tatiana Ferreira Lozano Pereira and her husband, Alex Cantelli Pereira, were indicted for triple qualified murder and concealment of a corpse. Miller da Silva Barisa and Victor Roberto da Silva were indicted for qualified murder and corruption of a minor due to the participation of Victor's underage girlfriend, who would answer for a charge in youth court equivalent to qualified homicide. The next day, Tatiana's mother, Ana Maria, defended her daughter in the media, saying Ataberly had many enemies, including the two young men arrested for the attack. Her daughter, she said, loved her son and never showed prejudice because he was gay. There was no homophobia. He was very difficult, but he was ours. We loved him. We cared for him. That's not how others are talking. She did whatever he wanted because she loved him. Tatiana and Etaberly, Anna said, had a complicated relationship because Etaberly was going through a very rebellious phase. Because of his bad behavior, she claimed, he got involved with unsavory activities and, as a result, began to receive threats. I think my daughter was under a lot of pressure from these people who wanted to take Etaberly. It was too much of a threat. On that day, I don't know if these people came there of their own free will, but what I do know is that my daughter was a prisoner of a Etaberly. I don't know whether to be confused or enraged by that statement. It's very possible something was lost in translation, but I can't figure out what Anna may have meant. Anna continued, I don't believe my daughter is a murderer. I'll never believe it. She just wanted him to get better. She used to say, Mother, when he turns 18, he'll get better. He'll mature. He won't be rebellious anymore. And I agreed. Again, for what it's worth, absolutely no one besides Tatiana and her mother made any claims whatsoever that Etaberly was in any way troubled, problematic, or aggressive. A second reenactment took place on May 18, 2017, involving Alex, Victor, and Miller giving separate accounts of what happened on the evening of Etaberly's murder. Afterward, police officer Eduardo Lebrandi Jr. said that the reconstruction reinforced the theory that Tatiana set up the ambush with the help of the young men and the 16-year-old girl. After they beat Etaberly, she then stabbed him in the neck, killing him, and her husband then helped her dispose of the body. Police still had doubts that Alex had no more involvement than the concealment of the body. They were skeptical of his and Tatiana's claims that he slept through the brutal attack on his stepson, especially considering the small size of the home. 
the lawyer by that time representing both Alex and Tatiana, Hamilton Polino Pereira Jr., was present for the reenactment, later saying, Alex did not witness the murder himself. Now police are trying to determine who stabbed a Taberly, so the reconstruction is being done. The statements from all the parties are very confusing. Each tries to redirect the blame from himself, so it's a very complex case. Mr. Pereira said that Tatiana still denied the accusations of homophobia, pointing out that she got her son a job at the supermarket where she worked, which he said pointed to a good relationship between them. I went to Tremembi, but she said little. She is in shock. She just denies it. She didn't make any further comments. The motive seems to be friction that existed between mother and son for more than a year. Their relationship was very complicated. The first DNA test results came back inconclusive using Tatiana's DNA to compare to that of the charred body found in the sugarcane field. A second test was conducted using DNA from paternal grandmother Julia Gabriel Rosa, and this confirmed the body was indeed that of 17-year-old Etaberly Lozano. At last, six long months after his death, Etaberly's body was given to the family so they could lay him to rest. His remains were placed into a heartbreakingly small, white coffin, which was draped with a t-shirt bearing various photos of a taberly. He was buried on July 15, 2017, in the Cravinos Municipal Cemetery. In the months prior to the defendant's joint trial, the prosecution collected a series of recordings from friends and neighbors of the family who knew the problems in the household began when Etaberly revealed his sexuality to his mother. Many said there were frequent arguments, and some said Tatiana even made fun of her son when he returned home after being beaten by other boys. Even so, and despite the prosecutor's belief that Tatiana's intolerance toward her son's sexual orientation led to Etaberly's murder, in September of 2019, a judge ruled that homophobia was not an element in the crime. At the same time, stepfather Alex's qualified murder charge was dropped, leaving him facing only a charge of concealment of a corpse. In the wake of these decisions, around 200 protesters gathered at the cemetery and marched through the streets of Curvinos, where they amassed outside the civil police headquarters. The demonstration was peaceful and no one was arrested, as those present only called for peace and love, discussing homophobia and the prevalence of violence toward the LGBTQ plus community in Brazil. In early 2018, it was reported that Brazil had the highest LGBTQ plus homicide rate in the world. That rate only increased in the wake of the country's presidential election later that year. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, who was sworn in on January 1, 2019, is well known for making homophobic, transphobic, misogynist, and otherwise bigoted statements. In 2019, he said he didn't want Brazil to become a paradise for gay tourism, as if gay money doesn't spend exactly the same as any other currency. His homophobic attitudes certainly didn't begin with his presidency. All the way back in 2011, Bolsonaro accused the Ministry of Education of encouraging homosexuality for promoting a project intended to teach schoolchildren diversity and combat homophobia. In 2014, he explicitly accused those defending the teaching of diversity of wanting to bring the subject into schools to transform six-year-olds into homosexuals. This facilitates pedophilia in Brazil. In an interview, Bolsonaro denied that homosexuals in Brazil suffer discrimination, harassment, or violence, saying, Homosexuals want to pass themselves off as victims. They want superpowers. A homosexual dies in Brazil, and the media are immediately saying that it is homophobia. Many are killed by their colleagues in places of prostitution or by overdose. They die, and the activists immediately say that it is homophobia. In Brazil, ten women die every day murdered by their partners. That is much more serious. Homophobic crimes should be treated like any other crime. How many heterosexuals die each day? Many more than homosexuals. Another choice quote is one you won't believe this man spewed in the middle of his somehow successful political career in response to a proposed law punishing homophobic violence. Just because someone likes to give his ass, he becomes a demigod and can't take a beating? This is the leader of the entire country we're talking about here. In 2018, Bolsonaro had a couple real bangers, such as, If a homosexual couple comes to live next to me, it will devalue my house. If they walk hand in hand and kiss, it devalues. The last quote I'll share today is truly indicative of this man's character. I would be incapable of loving a homosexual child. 
I'd rather have my son die in an accident than show up with a mustache around. To me, he will have died anyway. On a much more positive note, Brazil is host to the annual Sao Paulo Gay Pride Parade, which is the world's largest LGBTQ plus pride celebration, according to the Guinness World Records. Gay marriage is legal in Brazil, as is same-sex adoption. Brazilian states are prohibited from creating discriminatory laws against LGBTQ plus people. The country's public health system provides free sex reassignment surgery because transsexuality in Brazil is considered a sexual identity disturbance that can lead to intense suffering and increased suicide rates, which is an incredibly progressive stance. In 2018, the country's superior electoral court ruled that transgender people can run in Brazilian elections under their preferred names. LGBTQ plus people are allowed to serve in the Brazilian armed forces. So-called conversion therapy was officially outlawed by Brazil's federal Supreme Court in 2017, although it had been banned by the Federal Psychology Council since 1999. As of May of 2020, gay and bisexual men are allowed to donate blood in Brazil under the same terms as heterosexual men. According to a 2022 survey, the percentage of Brazilians who think homosexuality should be accepted by society made a significant jump from 64% in 2014 to 79% in 2022. Brazil's next presidential election will take place on October 2, 2022. Here's hoping their next leader is the polar opposite of Bolsonaro. By the way, if this segment has upset you, get in line. The number of negative comments I've received during Pride Month is beyond ridiculous. I have no intention of getting political on this show, so if you think the last few episodes have been in any way political, or if you don't believe that LGBTQ plus rights are human rights and that these kids deserve a voice just as much as all of the other kids I've covered, this might not be the right podcast for you. We practice empathy here. The trial took place in November of 2019 at the Forum of Ribeiro Preto before Judge Marta Rodriguez Mafeas Moreira. Tatiana Ferreira Lozano Pereira and Alex Cantelli Pereira were represented by Hamilton Paulino Pereira Jr., while Victor Roberto da Silva and Miller da Silva Barisa were represented by lawyer Flavio Tipello. On Tuesday, November 26, 2019, 20 witnesses testified before the court, as did the four defendants. The evidence was presented in a 1,600-page document. During his testimony, Alex turned on his wife, testifying against Tatiana, which led to their shared attorney, Mr. Pereira, resigning from Alex's defense. Because of this, Alex's trial had to be postponed to a future unspecified date. The second day of the trial, which was on November 27th, consisted of the arguments of both the prosecution and the defense. At the end of the second day, the jury declared the guilt of the remaining defendants. After the trial, Tatiana's defense lawyer, Mr. Pereira, said, I do not agree because this case, in terms of evidence, is very weak. The defense believes it shouldn't have been the way it was. Our client should have been acquitted. Assistant prosecutor and attorney for the family, Wagner Severino Samoas, said Alex's testimony was instrumental in the conviction of his wife, adding, He said that she confessed to him that she had stabbed a tabberly with a knife. The verdict was what we expected. We are satisfied and happy that justice has been done, although we do not have a tabberly back. Prosecutor Elizio Jose Barardo Gonsalves said, It was a pretty tough jury. A lot of attention was drawn to the coldness of the defendant, the boy's mother, and the other defendants as well. The coldness, the cruelty, the facts of how it happened. Tatiana received a maximum sentence of 25 years and 8 months, which she is serving in the Tremembi Women's Penitentiary in Sao Paulo. Victor and Miller were each sentenced to 21 years and 8 months for their participation in the crime, and Victor's former underage girlfriend was sentenced to remain for an undetermined amount of time in the Casa Foundation, where she had been held since 2017. The lawyers for all parties confirmed they intended to appeal for reduced sentences, but I wasn't able to find any information indicating that had taken place. Alex's trial has apparently not yet been rescheduled. My heart breaks for little M, Itaberly's brother, who must be around ten now. That poor kid lost his entire family. I hope he's safe and surrounded by people who love him and will never let Itaberly's memory fade for him. 
If he was alive today, Metaberly would be turning 23 on September 13, 2022. When he was murdered, a true light was extinguished, and the world is a little dimmer for it. Rest in peace, Etaberly. You will always be remembered. My sources for this episode were the Brazilian news outlet G1, Arquivo Criminal or Crime File on YouTube, RPP News, Out, LGBTQ Nation, Cristianos Gays or Gay Christians, El País Brazilian Edition, The Inquisitor, Seven News, Facebook, Wikipedia, Human Rights Watch, and Brazil's Electronic Justice Automation System. That's it for this week. Join me next week for another episode. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com, where you can listen to episodes or become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod and on Twitter and TikTok at STLCPod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook and Instagram. For more stories like the one you heard today, visit SufferTheLittleChildrenBlog.com. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. All music for the show is licensed from AudioJungle.net. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to SufferTheLittleChildren.pod at gmail.com. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit ChildHelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. If you see something, say something. Until next week, bye everyone.